My name is Dr. Christy Del Castillo Hege of the Fed is Best Foundation. This is the third of a series of lectures I've prepared to advocate for safer newborn breastfeeding practices. This lecture will review the lessons learned from the most recent data on newborn breastfeeding complications. In this lecture, I will go over in detail how mothers and healthcare providers can improve monitoring of exclusively breastfed newborns in order to prevent accidental starvation and brain injury. The leading causes of newborn hospitalizations are complications associated with insufficient feeding from early exclusive breastfeeding. This table is from a paper published by a large Utah healthcare system documenting that the most common reasons for newborn readmissions were for feeding problems and jaundice. Complications from early exclusive breastfeeding are most commonly caused by insufficient breast milk production, which occurs to 22% of all exclusively breastfeeding mothers, as well as 44% of first-time mothers. Ineffective latch by babies who are still learning to breastfeed is a secondary cause of newborn underfeeding. These lead to the complications of excessive jaundice or hyperbilirubinemia, dehydration, hypernatremia, excessive weight loss from insufficient caloric intake, and finally, hypoglycemia, all markers of newborn starvation that can cause brain injury. Just one episode of starvation can disable a child for life. Therefore, our most important job is to make sure a baby is fed enough calories and fluid to protect their brain and life, whatever way we can. In this lecture, I will go over how a mother can ensure adequate feeding of her newborn. I will review the signs of underfeeding and low blood sugar. I will discuss in detail our hospital recommendations and discharge instructions for protecting breastfed babies from underfeeding. I will review the indications for supplementation. And lastly, I will review how to supplement babies while promoting breastfeeding success. The most recent data on the caloric content of colostrum has uncovered that in fact, it has fewer calories than mature breast milk, which means that the average mother's colostrum production provides about a tenth and a third of the caloric and fluid requirement of a newborn on the first two days of life. Therefore, exclusively breastfed newborns are in fact fasting on the first days of life until a mother produces copious milk. Historical data published on native breastfeeding practices all over the world shows that all countries with high breastfeeding prevalence rates use pre-lacteal feeding to supplement newborns in the first days of life. This prevented the complications of jaundice, dehydration, and hypoglycemia, as well as brain injury and death from insufficient feeding. Despite high rates of supplementation, these countries breastfed their babies for extended periods of time, with two-year-old breastfeeding prevalences of 90% or greater, which suggests that previous assertions that supplementation interferes with breastfeeding simply identified mothers who needed to supplement due to their pre-existing limitations to produce milk. These studies assume that all mothers can produce the same amount of milk given enough effort by withholding supplementation. These are logical fallacies that have caused breastfed newborns to starve unnecessarily and have resulted in an exponential rise in breastfeeding tragedies and hospitalizations. Insufficient breast milk production from delayed copious milk production has been found to be common occurring to at least one in five exclusively breastfeeding mother and at least two in five of first-time exclusively breastfeeding mothers, according to breastfeeding research. These delays cause excessive weight loss in exclusively breastfed newborns. It has also been found that one in 10 of all exclusively breastfed newborns and one in four of those that are first born are hypoglycemic by six hours of life, which is brain threatening if undetected and uncorrected. Since exclusively breastfed newborns are currently unmonitored for hypoglycemia, it is unclear how many are experiencing brain cell loss from undetected hypoglycemia. This level of hypoglycemia has been found to increase the risk of brain injury visible on MRI and lead to lower motor, cognitive, and language development at one year of age. 
In addition, a recent study on transient hypoglycemia diagnosed through universal three-hour screening found that babies with hypoglycemia, even if corrected, had 50% reductions in their ability to gain proficiency in fourth grade literacy and math, suggesting cognitive declines that are long-term and permanent. Most disturbingly, the most recent article showing the effects of hypoglycemia diagnosed in lethargic, exclusively breastfed newborns showed that by the time they are lethargic, they may have already developed widespread brain injury, resulting in lifelong disability. This can all be prevented with earlier supplementation after breastfeeding in underfed newborns, which not only protects the newborn brain from starvation and injury, but has also been shown to nearly double exclusive breastfeeding rates at three months. The main lessons to be learned from the latest data are that exclusively breastfed newborns are at high risk for hypoglycemia while having no symptoms. This means they should receive glucose monitoring similar to other high-risk newborns. Waiting for exclusively breastfed newborns to become symptomatic or lethargic from hypoglycemia can result in preventable lifelong disability. Earlier supplementation can prevent these tragedies while improving breastfeeding success. And these findings highlight that no benefit of exclusive breastfeeding justifies the risk of hypoglycemic brain injury. The goal of feeding is to prevent critical starvation that leads to brain injury. And only the baby knows when they have run out of reserve fuel. These are the Fed is Best guidelines for safe early breastfeeding. The guidelines call upon the joint collaboration of mothers and health professionals to closely monitor and ensure adequate feeding. Clinical data and recommended thresholds for supplementation are shared with mothers so that they may be equally informed with the critical data that protects her child's brain and future potential. It is vital that all parents be as informed about feeding physiology as health professionals, as tragedies in infant feeding have severe and irreversible consequences. These guidelines are meant to inform and improve the current system of newborn feeding and does not replace in-person evaluation and treatment by a physician trained in newborn care. The goals of these guidelines are for no child to experience complications from underfeeding. Mothers, before going to the hospital, download, review, and fill out your feeding plan. The Fed is Best feeding plan is available at fedisbest.org and evaluates mothers for the most common risk factors for insufficient breast milk production to prevent accidental newborn starvation. It reviews all the possible options you have with regard to feeding your baby, including the risks and benefits and scientific data that supports each of those options. You have the right to choose how you feed your baby, and the right to decide based on the risks and benefits of each choice. It includes decisions regarding what you would like to happen in case breastfeeding is not sufficient to meet your baby's needs. Bring this to your hospital and discuss your plan with your healthcare team before birth. Before every breastfeeding session, express your breast to check for presence of milk. Hand expression of breast milk can be learned through the Stanford Medicine Newborn Nursery website by searching for Stanford hand expression of breast milk. As some mothers do not produce colostrum, this is an easy way to prevent newborn starvation. Breastfeed as soon as possible within the first hour of life, as newborns can become hypoglycemic within that time. Ask for help with correct latch, positioning, and hearing of swallows. Breastfeed for 30 to 40 minutes as tolerated by your child, 15 to 20 minutes each breast, while manually expressing to promote breast emptying. Feed every two to three hours and on demand following the baby's hunger cues. If there's little to no colostrum present, supplement after breastfeeding. There is a widely taught misperception among health providers that a newborn can go 24 hours without any milk intake. This has been proven to be a dangerous misperception as exclusively breastfed newborns can become hypoglycemic by one hour to a level that can cause long-term cognitive declines. 
Therefore, a newborn requires confirmed feeding of sufficient calories to prevent hypoglycemia. This can be done 15 mLs or a half ounce at a time with safe, tested, and pasteurized donor breast milk or formula. As it has been shown that the newborn's stomach capacity at birth is in fact 20 mLs and empties during feeding into the intestines. This can be done after breastfeeding and repeated based on hunger cues as many newborns can be born depleted of fuel reserves due to prolonged and stressful labor. Since a single 5 ml colostrum feeding only provides 3 calories of the 300 calories an average 3 kilo newborn needs, colostrum is unlikely to prevent hypoglycemia, particularly if a newborn's caloric reserve is already depleted. Supplementation only after breastfeeding will preserve the stimulus for breast milk production while providing the needed calories to prevent hypoglycemia. Babies born depleted from birth due to maternal fasting, prolonged deliveries, fetal distress, prematurity, and babies who have higher metabolic need due to large size and other medical conditions may take as much as 60 mLs per feed to restore caloric reserves. This would require 5.5 to 6 ounces per kilo per day of total milk intake. The scientific data has found that wet and dirty diaper counts do not predict adequate milk transfer in the first days of life. This suggests that diapers mostly come from the fluid and meconium babies are born with. This study published in the Journal of Human Lactation found that babies who lost excessive weight of greater than 10% represented by the black bars on the graph were able to produce up to 6 and even 8 wet diapers on the fourth day of life. Similarly, underfed newborns were able to produce up to six dirty diapers as well. Obtain weight checks every 12 hours as it's been shown that exclusively breastfed newborns can lose a full 7 to 8 percent within the first 24 hours. Weight loss of 3 to 4 percent by 12 hours suggests excessive weight loss and earlier need for supplementation. In addition, 4% weight loss by 24 hours and 7% by 48 hours has been shown to be correlated with developing excessive jaundice of greater than 15 mg per deciliter, which not only requires hospitalization for phototherapy, but also increases the risk of multiple developmental disabilities. Supplementation before the development of excessive weight loss can prevent hospitalization and the associated increased risk of disability. Excessive weight loss of 4% by 12 to 24 hours and 7% at any time requires immediate evaluation for signs of newborn distress, dehydration, abnormal vital signs, glucose, and bilirubin. Babies should lose no greater than 7% at any time, as it has been associated with the development of pathological jaundice and hypernatremic dehydration. In a study of over 4,500 freely fed, healthy, term vaginally delivered newborns, 7% was the maximum these newborns allowed themselves to lose, which suggests that it is the maximum physiologically tolerable weight loss of a newborn. It is recommended that a mother proceed with supplemented breastfeeding if these weight loss thresholds are reached. Persistent crying after breastfeeding is a sign of hunger and insufficient breast milk intake or production. It is also a sign of hypoglycemia or pending hypoglycemia. Lethargy or being too weak to feed are also signs of hypoglycemia. Newborn distress or a mother concerned about newborn distress should signal immediate medical evaluation. If your baby is premature, small, or large for gestational age, medically fragile, or you are diabetic, your baby will need closer monitoring and earlier supplementation to prevent hypoglycemia. Consult with your pediatrician or neonatologist. Supplemented breastfeeding in the first days of life is a valid and safe feeding choice, as no benefit of exclusive breastfeeding justifies the risk of hypoglycemic brain injury.
In fact, the historical evidence of native breastfeeding practices suggests that supplemented breastfeeding was the predominant and most advantageous form of newborn feeding practice throughout the world. Newborns that exhibit the following signs require immediate blood glucose check and treatment with IV glucose and supplementation if below 50 mg per deciliter. Low body temperature. Excessive crying even after nursing, as well as prolonged and unsatisfied nursing. Excessive sleepiness, difficulty to arouse, and poor feeding. Shakiness or jitteriness, especially of the hands. Seizure activity with unusual stiffening, repetitive jerking, and eyes rolling back. Low heart rate, decreased breathing, blue skin are late signs of hypoglycemia. Your pediatrician is the only health professional qualified to evaluate a newborn for dehydration, starvation, and need for supplementation in order to protect your baby's brain and life. If you are concerned about the adequacy of your baby's feeding, you must receive an evaluation from your child's pediatrician. However, the ultimate authority over the decision to supplement is the mother. No mother can be barred from supplementing her baby if she wishes to do so at any time. It is the responsibility of hospitals to support mother's feeding choices while ensuring her child gets fed enough calories and fluid to protect her child's brain and life. The following are the fed is best hospital recommendations. The first step in supporting a mother's feeding choices is to review the mother's feeding plan and preferences upon admission to the hospital. Feeding is a patient right and cannot be superseded by hospital quality improvement goals. Her feeding plan is a legal document and protects her baby from the dangers of underfeeding. Assess a mother's risk factors for insufficient milk production and feeding complications, which can be found on the feeding plan. Encourage mothers to assess for presence of colostrum using video instruction. Provide informed consent of the increased risk of excessive jaundice, dehydration, hypoglycemia, and brain injury associated with exclusive breastfeeding before lactogenesis too, as well as the risk of decreased milk supply if supplementing without adequate time breastfeeding. Ensure actual feeding of milk within the first hour of life. Provide education on latch, positioning, technique, and listening for swallowing. Provide instruction on manual expression of breast during feeding to promote breast emptying. And offer a pump for any missed feedings. Provide education on different ways to supplement after breastfeeding as medically indicated or preferred by the mother. This includes supplementation by finger and syringe feeding, supplementation by supplemental nursing system, as well as bottle feeding. Mothers can be offered safe, tested, human milk bank milk or formula for supplementation. Supplementation should be offered a half ounce at a time followed by burping. Weigh the baby every 12 hours to prevent excessive weight loss. Weight loss of greater than 4% by 12 to 24 hours and 7% at any time should signal medical evaluation to assess the breastfeeding and the need for supplementation. These weight loss thresholds are associated with the development of pathologic hyperbilirubinemia and hypernatremic dehydration, which are both associated with brain injury, long-term disability, and death. However, Weight loss cannot accurately predict the development of hypoglycemia, as a child can develop hypoglycemia at any weight loss percent. Since a child can be born depleted and hypoglycemic, percent weight loss alone is not sufficient for preventing starvation-related brain injury. The most recent data shows that healthy, term, exclusively breastfed babies are in fact high risk for developing hypoglycemia. Exclusive colostrum feeding by an average mother provides 1.5 calories per hour on the first day of life. This is roughly a tenth of a 3 kilo newborn's daily requirement. 
Glucose monitoring must start at birth through cord blood testing and no later than one hour of life, as exclusively breastfed newborns have been found to be hypoglycemic by one hour. Any newborn with inconsolable crying despite breastfeeding requires a glucose check. Continuous glucose monitoring is a newly available technology that can more closely monitor hypoglycemia to prevent newborn brain injury. Babies found to be hypoglycemic can enter the hospital's hypoglycemia protocol and can be treated with IV glucose and supplemental feeding. The Fed is Best Foundation believes that newborns deserve a margin of safety. The Pediatric Endocrine Society recommends a glucose of no lower than 50 mg per deciliter in the first 48 hours and no lower than 60 mg per deciliter thereafter. Mothers, if your child is hypoglycemic below those levels, we recommend supplemented breastfeeding of 30 to 60 mL after nursing on demand, depending on your newborn's hunger cues for a total of 110 to 120 calories per kilogram per day or 5.5 to 6 ounces per kilo of total milk intake per day. Burping after each half ounce can prevent gas and regurgitation. What is the hypoglycemic threshold? This is a widely debated subject. However, the neuroendocrine response is a phenomenon observed when blood glucose levels drop and the brain releases hormones that signal the body to increase blood sugar. This is the brain's mechanism for protecting itself from cell death. The brain's tolerance for low blood sugar does not change according to their time out from birth. In fact, the neuroendocrine response occurs between 50 to 60 in both adults as well as newborns. The Fed is Best Guidelines recommends that the brain's preference should be honored. There is no evidence that glucose levels of less than 47 to 50 are benign, and there is in fact evidence that glucose levels of less than 47 increase the risk of brain injury visible on MRI and increase the risk of long-term cognitive impairment. Furthermore, keeping glucose levels above 47 is the only prospectively validated glucose threshold that has been shown to prevent developmental delay. Babies deserve a margin of safety. Therefore, we recommend correcting glucoses less than 50 to 60 with oral supplementation and IV glucose infusion to achieve normal glycemia. The Fed is Best Foundation also recommends against IV glucose boluses, as animal studies and studies on newborns experiencing hypoxia and ischemia suggest negative consequences of acute hyperglycemia to the newborn brain. Transient episodes of fetal hypoxia and ischemia are common as natural consequences of uterine contractions and umbilical cord compression during vaginal delivery. The image on the right is a study published on the effects of rapid glucose infusion on rats experiencing 30 minutes of hypoxia and ischemia. The right-hand column shows the effects of rapid infusion of glucose on the brain, which causes massive destruction of brain tissue. This phenomenon has subsequently been corroborated by the Cool Cap study published in 2015, showing that newborns with known hypoxia and ischemia had increased risk of death or severe neurological disability when exposed to hyperglycemia. Provide a minimum daily transcutaneous or serum bilirubin check until the onset of copious milk production and successful establishment of full feedings as signaled by the onset of daily weight gain. Developing a bilirubin of greater than 15 mg per deciliter, even with correction, increases the risk of lifelong disability, and levels of greater than 17 mg per deciliter has been shown to increase serum levels of brain injury markers. It is not clear what level of bilirubin is truly safe, but at this time, developing a level above 15 or any level considered high risk on the Bhutani nomogram due to non-hemolytic or starvation-related jaundice is unacceptable and can lead to irreversible lifelong disability. Feeding the full milk requirement of a baby, which is around 16 ounces a day, is the primary way the body removes bilirubin. Advising mothers to use sunlight alone to reduce jaundice without ensuring her child is receiving his full milk requirement is ineffective and potentially dangerous, since kidney removal of bilirubin is a fraction of biliary excretion of bilirubin into the baby's stool. 
Finally, making exclusive breastfeeding rates at discharge the primary marker of quality improvement does not improve long-term breastfeeding rates and only increases the rates of starvation-related complications to babies. Since one in five exclusively breastfeeding mother will not have sufficient milk in the first days of life to prevent these complications, hospital policies that attempt to increase exclusive breastfeeding at discharge is not only counterproductive to breastfeeding, but dangerous to the newborn child. The safe and ethical quality improvement measure should be a goal of zero complications to the newborn for insufficient milk intake. Nearly all mothers can prevent starvation by checking her milk production, listening for the cries of hunger, and supplementing when there is insufficient milk present. It is the responsibility of hospitals to do no harm and perform better than a mother using her natural instincts to feed her own baby. The reasons for supplementation are the following. Hypoglycemia of less than 50 milligrams per deciliter, Dehydration or excessive weight loss of greater than 4% in the first 12 to 24 hours and greater than 7% at any time. High sodium. Hyperbilirubinemia or abnormal bilirubin above 14 mg per deciliter or any high risk level on the bilirubin nomogram. Lethargy. Poor latch and feeding despite correction. Intolerable pain during feedings despite correction mother-baby separation, maternal medications that are unsafe to her baby, metabolic abnormalities or complications to the baby, insufficient milk production, and finally mother's preference and the baby's persistent crying or hunger signs. Any breastfeeding mother sent home before the onset of copious milk production and successful transfer of milk signaled by daily weight gain must be taught how to supplement in the event that her milk does not come in or breastfeeding difficulties arise to prevent newborn brain injury from jaundice, dehydration, and hypoglycemia. She must be given the signs and symptoms of newborn starvation including excessive crying as well as lethargy. And she must be given next day after discharge follow-up with universal bilirubin and glucose checks and discussion of percent weight loss limits as previously described. If no such follow-up is available, she should be instructed to supplement if she is concerned about her baby not receiving enough milk through breastfeeding. For breastfeeding mothers, any baby in distress or crying inconsolably, even after breastfeeding, is hungry. They deserve immediate supplementation to prevent brain injury. Only after the child's needs are met can breastfeeding be evaluated by checking the breast for milk with manual expression or pumping, weighed feedings, percent weight loss evaluation, and bilirubin and glucose checks. The Fed is Best Foundation recommends that every exclusively breastfed baby is weighed every 12 hours during their hospital admission and after discharge until the onset of copious milk production and daily weight gain of the newborn is established. The best way to protect the newborn brain is to prevent the starvation-related complications from happening with adequate and confirmed feedings. How can a mother supplement while promoting breastfeeding success? Number one, supplement only after breastfeeding 15 to 20 minutes each breast every two to three hours, or more frequently based on baby's hunger cues. Number two, manually express breast to assist milk transfer during breastfeeding. Number three, supplement 15 mLs or a half ounce at a time until newborn distress, hunger cues, lethargy, and other medical indications resolve. This can be done by finger feeding, syringe feeding, spoon, dropper, medicine cup, and SNS feeding at the breast. Instructions for supplemental feeding methods can be found at the fedisbest.org resource page. Number four, burp the baby after every half ounce feed to prevent regurgitation and gas. Five, pump both breasts for 15 to 20 minutes, preferably with a double electric pump for any missed feedings. 
Persistent crying and exclusively breastfed newborn, especially before copious milk production, is a sign of hunger. If a newborn is in distress despite nursing, supplement after breastfeeding and use other means to promote milk production if necessary until you get help. No benefit of exclusive breastfeeding justifies the risk of hypoglycemic brain injury. And newborn brain injury from accidental starvation is a mistake that can never be reversed. According to the most recent review article published in the Journal of Physiology, Endocrinology, and Metabolism by Dr. Shannon Kelleher, human milk investigator, she wrote that frank lactation failure can occur to as many as 10 to 15 percent of mothers, and insufficient breast milk for exclusive breastfeeding up to six months can happen to 40 to 90 percent of mothers. That translates to millions of babies who require protection from starvation-related complications with supplemental feeding. It is imperative that every mother and newborn health provider is knowledgeable in the methods of preventing newborn starvation by diagnosing breastfeeding problems before the complications occur to the newborn. For more information on brain protective feeding, go to the Fed is Best Foundation resources page at fedisbest.org backslash resources for parents.